All right, so where we left off last time was we uh, went through this um, idea of thermal resistances where we, we introduced what thermal resistances are. And um, we, we talked through uh, how you actually use thermal resistances in a problem to determine what's important. So usually thermal resistances are not the, the end all of the, of the analysis or a tool to get you to a point where, um, where, where you can then decide what, what to do, what to do with that information. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do today is I thought it'd be useful to go through uh, an example and maybe a bit, bit more practical example. Last time we just had a two, a two material uh, series resistance and we just went through that. This is a little bit more, more detailed and it gives some nuance that I think is helpful. All right, this example um, is a, a chip, a computer chip. And so you might have like a, an application where you have a power electronics system and there's current going through this chip and that chip is switching the current on or off, for example. And um, that's what the example is here. And so there's a cooling load that's required with that, right? The, the chip is not 100% efficient. So there's gonna be heat generated in this chip as it's operating. So you have to figure out how to get this thing cooled off. Uh, so what we have, uh, what's shown up here, is this what's shown up here is the chip, right? This here is, is our, our chip. Uh, this down here is what's called a spreader, right? So the spreader is just a conductive metal. And the point of this spreader is to get heat away from the chip and cool it off. So that's usually exposed to some coolant on these surfaces. Uh, so down here, you can see, I guess we've got H bar W, T, W. So let's just assume this is water. So this would be like a water cool, high power, power electronics application. Uh, it turns out you can't just mount a computer chip directly to a piece of metal. It has to be electrically isolated. Um, so this uh, layer here is a dielectric. It's just a thin electrically insulating material. Um, but it tends to also be pretty, you know, pretty bad conductor, right? So you can look at right, the, the conductivity of this dielectric is pretty bad, right? Com especially compared to the metal, which is much higher. Um, okay, so we want in this problem, just to understand, uh, you know, say we're designing this chip, we wanna know is our chip in this system, in this cooling condition, is our chip gonna survive or is it gonna melt? Right? You can probably get a good handle on this just using thermal resistances. Uh, okay, so here we have our, our geometry. Um, uh, note what we have on top here, right? So up here we have both uh, convection and we have radiation, right? So if you ever see epsilon, epsilon is the emissivity of the surface. That's uh, indicating there's radiation occurring. So we actually have two modes of, of heat transfer that we're trying to, to deal with. For this problem, let's actually just assume that there's, it's a 1D problem, right? So heat's only allowed to flow in this direction. length over here, what is this? This thickness is uh, 7.5 millimeters compared to the width, which is two centimeters. So it's not drawn to scale. So really the edges are kind of insignificant. Um, so we'll just, we'll just kind of look at this surface up here, uh, what's going on in this direction, and this surface down here, okay? All right, so let's start by, uh, uh, let's start by drawing out a resistance network for this, okay? Um, here's our system. Let's draw our resistance network. Uh, let's start with, um, let's say, the water side. Okay, so the water side over here, uh, here. So this is our water node. This is kind of how we started last time. We'll call this TW. Um, so what do we have in our, in our network? We have convection here, right? We have conduction across this body. We have, uh, I guess we're, Ignoring any contact resistance, it's not given to us. So then we have conduction and then conduction across this, um, the chip as well. Okay, so, uh, and then up on the top, we have, like I said, convection and radiation out here. Okay, let's erase some of this. Okay, so back to here, we start with our, well, so we have uh, conduction first, right? So this is our conduction, oh, sorry, convection, right? our convection from the water to the, to the wall. Okay, so we'll call that our conv convection W, and then we have our conduction, our conduction on the spreader, which we'll denote S. Uh, and then we have another 
split conduction, R conduction in the dielectric, D, and another conduction, R conduction in the chip, C. Okay, and then to get from the chip, so at this point, this temperature node here is the temperature at the top of the chip. Right, this is the very the boundary between the chip and the uh, the outer conditions on the top, right? So um, at this point, he can go one of two ways, right? So he could go uh, to convection, or convection to uh, what do we call this air? So I guess on the top we have A, right? So air, it's exposed to air. Um, or it could go uh, down here. And we call this radi our radiation to the air. Okay, both of these are actually at, at the same temperature, so you could pull them back together and, and call this TA. Okay, this is our resistance network for this system. Um, if we had multiple modes of heat transfer, like more modes of heat transfer, like uh, um, in this area, we would have more in parallel, or you can you can stack up these parallel resistances if you want. Um, but this, if you take in circuits, this should kind of look familiar. Right, or taking heat transfer before. So one thing that we didn't deal with yet is this generation here. So the chip is generating energy. It's, it's inefficient. There's generation happening within this body. Um, but if you remember back to when we derived the resistance, we did not have any generation or internal energy storage in our in our uh, set of um, in our ODE when we actually solved for what the resistance equation was. So we can't directly model generation. As part of the system, we have to make an approximation. Well, fortunately for this particular system, it turns out that actually generation is kind of a function of position. Uh, most of the generation is occurring near the top of the chip um, for whatever reason. And so it's, it's a pretty good approximation to just say that we have a heat flow coming in at this, at this node, right at the top surface. And we'll just call that um, G dot, so G dot. And that's equal to five watts for this. Okay, so we have our resistance network. Now the next thing is to actually get all this information and we'll solve this problem using ease because um, it's kind of a, a helpful way to do that. Um, so let's go through and see how we do this in ease. Okay, so this is our, which example, chip. I believe this is it. Okay. Um, so what, what I've done here is I've entered all the, the problem information. Um, I think a lot of you have used these before, but we'll just kind of talk through it for those who haven't. So this is uh, how we enter information. You just you know, type it in. Um, you're going to say, here's our variable name, the assigned value. And then one of the really cool things about ease is that it actually automatically manages the units for you. So if you tell it up front what the units are. Um, it's going to keep track of all the units. And if you have any mismatch in, say, you're multiplying a length by a temperature or, you know, you're forgetting uh, some component of an equation um, that has some dimensionality to it, it'll catch that and it'll tell you, right? It'll tell you that there's a, a unit's problem. So that's a really useful way of um, not just being pedantic and making sure you label everything right, but checking your equations as you develop them. To, to it's kind of this, this sanity check as you're going is my is what I'm writing even make sense is it is there any coherence to what I'm doing it's just a, a second way of checking so anyways so you put in the units here square brackets and then you can convert them right this convert function uh, takes whatever units you're converting from and converting to and multiplies by the right factor and then and automatically switches the units in memory okay. So that's all we're doing here. So we went through in all the geometry, we have uh, the chip uh, thickness and width, generation, conductivities, and so on. Hopefully entered the same way they're on the page. Okay, so we've, we've gotten that information. Now we have to go back to here and we're gonna calculate for all of our different uh, resistances, the actual resistance values. Okay, so we have all of these different ones we have to keep track of. Um, let's just go back here. All right, so that's what we've done here. Our conduction, so we have our conduction uh, for the chip, dielectric, the spreader, the water and the air for convection and note that what we're doing. And then you can kind of see, actually this becomes important. So which, which areas or length scales are we using? If we look back here, we have 
WS is the spreader width. Oops, sorry. We look back here. Right, we had WS is the spreader width. WC is the chip width. And so we have to make sure we're using the right area, the right um, cross sectional area for the, con the convection and the conduction. All right, so we decided for the chip, that's the chip width squared. For the spreader, it's the spreader width squared with a corresponding property. All right, um, any questions on that so far, how we enter everything in? No? Okay. All right, um, the next step then is uh, we need to calculate, we've got all these resistances except for radiation. Right, and down here we've got our radiation. We're trying to enter in something for that. So we enter in our radiation equation. But remember, we are writing that in terms of the air temperature was just fixed, where we know that we're given that. But it has to be the, uh, the radiation from the emitting surface to the air temperature. And the emitting surface temperature is not known. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, what I like to do, I mean, you could just, there's, there's kind of two ways of doing it, right? You, you could write the equation. You're going to try to solve it in ease. Ease is going to say, sorry, you don't have enough equations. So you could say, okay, I'll put that aside. I'm going to keep writing equations until I get enough equations to be able to solve it. That's definitely a way you can do it. Um, hopefully, eventually, you get enough equations, and it solves, and everybody's happy. Right? Usually, what happens, though, is you'll write an equation. Uh, you may make a mistake at some point. You get to the end of your program. And you've got 50 equations and 50 unknowns, and you solve it, and it says uh, you'll complain about you know poorly form formulated problem or something like really infuriating. <laughs> like, well, I, I spent a lot of time on this. What do you mean poorly? Right? No, well, it's better just to go incrementally, and every time you enter an equation, stop, solve it, make sure it solves. Okay. In order to get that, uh, to, to do that for something like this, where you have this implicit implicit relationship. We need to provide it with an initial guess. Okay, it doesn't even have to be a good guess. It just has to be right on the right order of magnitude. So here we're saying TCG, which is our guess temperature for TC. We're just going to guess that that's equal to the air temperature. Is that right? It, probably not. If it is, then there's weird, you know, first law things happening. But it's at least order of magnitude close. An order of magnitude is all we really need for ease at this point. Okay, so we enter, enter in this guess. Excuse me. And here's our radiation resistance equation. Write it out in terms of the guess, and then we solve. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and uh, let me just comment this out too. All right, so comment it out. There we go. Solve it. Okay, these solve. So we, we are able to compute all of our resistances. 